Hello, bird nerds. Hello, bird nerds. It's the Monday Megaphone with me, Grant Williams, the bird nerd. And I'm joined always on our fortnight, but sometimes more often than that, Monday Megaphones by Dr. Polly Holly. Oh, that was going to happen one day. It was always going to happen for me to mess up and be in the age. The Holly Parsons, who is the manager of the Urban Birds Program at BirdLife Australia, otherwise known as Birds in Backyards. Hello, Holly. Hi. Yeah, it took a few episodes, but we stumbled over the name finally. Well done. Holly, I need to I need to follow up with you something that we were talking about in the last show. Your talk about garden birds in backyards. Yeah, it was great. I did a, a session for Lane Cove Council in Sydney talking about how to create great bird-friendly spaces and a little bit about urban birds and how they're tracking. I think everybody enjoyed it. I waffled way over time and and nobody left. So that was always a nice indication. So yeah, I've had some nice feedback from people and I I hope everybody learned something and can get some plants in the ground for birds. I'd know nothing about waffling over time, would I think at all about that? Tell me just before we introduce our our guests, our expert, our expert panel, I feel like we're on Q&A or something today or what we could be instead of uh, insiders where the I don't know, bush bashers or something. How many people came into the to the live stream? I'm really somewhere interested around, to know. Somewhere around 35, 40. That's really Yeah, yeah. Really so it's usually, I, I tend to find when I do a, a, like a, a free webinar, we've got about a 50-50 rate. So I think if they had about 50 or 60 people, I think, register, and, and about half came, which is about standard for a freebie. Yeah. Well, that's really good. How often do you do something like that? Oh, look, I, t- I tend to at least talk about birds in backyards and and doing surveys and things once every couple of months. So just within the urban bird program, there's usually one webinar every two months. And then, yeah, there's a few scattered ones depending on who's keen to hear me talk. So this weekend, I'm going to be at Eden Park Nursery in Sydney on Sunday, um, talking in person. It's my first in-person event in in a couple of years, talking about bird-friendly gardening, and we're going to have a bit of a walk around the nursery, which will be really exciting. And then there'll be powerful owl training coming up via webinars too, and I'll I'll dig out the dates for you. Great. Now, Holly, we we did mention in the last show that I'm going to be doing something like that too. So who knows? We might be able to, when I take the show on the road, we might be able to hit nurseries together and we'll have the bird expert and we'll have the horticulturist. Everyone, guess which one is which? Sounds good. Perfect storm, perfect storm. All right, introductions time. Hello, Fiona Backhouse, who has, you've been doing work on the Albert's Lyrebird, which is the less famous but equally spectacular of the Australian lyrebirds. And while we've got Fiona in with Holly and Matt, where we're talking about urban birds generally, the urban expanse is having a bit of an effect on Albert's Lyrebird. And Fiona's just published a paper all about it. So, Fiona, the floor is yours. Tell us about how your research got started and and where it is. I'm part of a lab that works on lyrebirds more broadly. And our overall topic of research is cultural evolution in lyrebirds. So birds obviously have their song. That's what they're often famous for, especially the lyrebird, which has its mimicry as well as its own songs. And we're interested in how this song has evolved, how it changes over the landscape and what it means. So uh, I decided to take on the Albert's lyrebird because I thought it was cool to do the lesser known species. I thought there was a bit more untouched ground there to look into. And also because they're a bit more threatened than the superb lyrebird. And that's what I've always been interested in is conservation. Yeah, I've spent the last four years studying variation across the range of Albert's lyrebirds in a number of their different vocalisation types. And my latest paper is on their mimicry and a couple of cool things to do with that. Now, Fiona, the place where you were studying them is really of interest to the the other three of us here. Not only were you looking at the, the life of the of the lyrebird and, and how each of the different populations have evolved alongside each other. But that area is being encroached on weak by humans. So tell us where exactly that you were located and what are the human pressures on the populations? And then, hey, let's go for it. Tell us about those distinct populations. Sure. So I had a number of populations throughout the range. 
The main ones were in the Border Rangers National Park and Lamington National Park, which are quite famous areas. So people listening in might have been there or heard of them. I had another population that was in Mount Jerusalem National Park. So that's pretty close to Mullumbimby on the north coast of New South Wales. Another population at Goombara in Main Range National Park. So that's in Queensland towards the west of the Albert Slyberds Range. So it's still within that sort of mountainous Great Dividing Range area. And another population in Tambourine Mountain in Queensland. And Tambourine Mountain is a fairly urban area. So there's a lot of little settlements up there. And so the Albert Slyberd habitat there is incredibly patchy. They really live in these small pockets of rainforest there. And there's not many live birds up there. I've also got some data from some other places. I've got a bit of data from Wollumbin, Mount Warning near Wollumba, which is again a fairly cleared area. There's a lot of farming around there as well as small towns. And I have some data from an area near Kalani, which is a very small patch that's surrounded by a lot of farmland. So the different populations I had vary in how much they've been impacted by humans. So some of them, like the border ranges in Lamington, are these beautiful, large, pristine areas of rainforest. And other places like Tambourine Mountain is really the, the last stronghold for live birds in that area. And what I found is that for each of these populations that I've looked at, they sound, they're all obviously Albert's live birds with the way they sound, but they do have differences. So one of my... One of my research questions was on one of their own songs, which you call the whistle song. And I've talked about that in, I think I talked about that in the previous podcast with the bird emergency as well as having a paper about that. And each of my different populations had a completely different whistle song. So you could work out which population the live bird was from based on what it sounds like. Now, sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask you to talk about the importance of the whistle song because Maybe people haven't. I can't imagine who wouldn't have already listened to that episode of the Bird Emergency Podcast, Fiona, but just in case they didn't. Sure. So we still don't fully know what the function of the whistle song is because you can never really know what's going on in the bird's mind. But it's a very loud, about six-second song that absolutely echoes through the rainforest. So if we can hear it from a long distance away, other live birds will be able to hear it from a long distance away. And as often in the past been called a territorial call, and it could be because these the male live birds are singing this to say, this is where I am, this is my territory. And one way that we can actually use it is, is when we're working out how many live birds are in an area, you can use that whistle song to have live bird surveys. So what people, not, people often do for that is they go out into the bush and they listen for this whistle song and then count how many they can hear and in what direction. So, so is that a really reliable method of doing a population estimate nowadays, Fiona? It's probably the most reliable one that we have because live birds are very difficult to see and to catch. So now what, what you have to do is estimate, because it's, it's the males that you're hearing with that whistle song, so you have to estimate how many females and juveniles there are in relation to the number of males as well. It's accurate to a point. So... Is there a ratio of male to female that you're looking for? I think the ratio that people were using, I'm not sure if I'm remembering this correctly, but I think it was one to three. So there's for every one male, there were three females or juveniles, but I could be wrong. It could be one to two. I'm not sure. There's a shot of how Fiona was collecting her data. Fiona, do you want to explain what you're holding? Yes. So that big uh, fluffy thing is called a shotgun microphone. So it's quite a long directional microphone so wherever you point it that's where the sound is coming from so it gets very directed sound and the thing on the outside is called a softy which is a very apt name and that sort of uh, minimizes other noise disturbance from things like wind yeah a nice wind cover so the, the so you're recording the calls with that equipment putting them in a recorder and then taking them back to put them in your computer there's a shot of fiona doing the glamorous kind of field work and the, the data analysis that needs to be done for all these projects. For setup? Yeah. For, for people who didn't hear or haven't heard the, the podcast episode, you were out in the wilds doing the work. You had to do the prep work of your analysis in the field. But tell us, are you using AI now for analysis of, of the sound clips? I have done some sort of automated stuff, but most of it is manual because our technology is not quite there to do it fully automated yet. Um, it's getting there and it's really good in some circumstances, but because I want to have very specific and high quality measurements, then I do all of that myself. So that obviously takes a long time to go through the recordings. If, you, if those people watching the stream, if you've got a question or a comment, feel free to pop them in and, and 
and get involved. Holly, Fiona mentioned the parks and the areas where she was working. That's in a real urban sprawl corridor. And for people not familiar with that northeast corner of the, the Byron Bay kind of corner of New South Wales and the Gold Coast corner of, of Queensland, it's rapidly developing. And the pressure on these populations is that they're all isolated. They're not connected to each other. Now, what I was interested to ask you, Holly, was with the surveys that that happened through Birds in Backyard and the wider surveys surveys with BirdLife Australia, was Alberts popping up in any of the regular surveying? Oh, you're asking me a very tricky question. I'll need to dive into the data. I can't recall seeing... Albert's Lyrebirds popping up in the Birds in Backyards data, but that's not surprising because they would not be considered to be a particularly backyard type bird that's going to just be popping through unless you are right on the edge of a really good patch of habitat. I will dive into the data right now and have a look. They do pop up in in the general bird surveys, but again, very restricted range, very hard to find. So when you're needing the specialist techniques like what Fiona has been using, audio calls, you're only going to be very lucky to be stumbling across actually seeing one to report one for a a survey, for sure. But you accept a call as a sighting, don't you, in all the surveys? Yes, we do, we do. It depends on how often that they are making that call. I don't know, Fiona, how often are they making a lot of noise or is there certain times of the year when they're more vocal? There's definitely certain times of the year. So the males display during winter. So from June to July and into August is their peak. So yeah, the best time to hear them is out in the winter and the males will sing a lot. So I had some individuals that would sing for constantly for about three hours or so every morning. Then have a bit of a break and then sing again over lunchtime, then another break and then sing again. So if you go out in winter, you'll hear them a lot. And that whistle song I mentioned, they tend to do that roughly every three minutes and then it's interspersed with mimicry. Fiona, can I ask you for people who are unfamiliar with with lyrebirds, how large is it? Well, actually three things. What What's the population estimate for that area of the country that you were studying? How many lyrebirds, Elvis lyrebirds, do you think are there? Uh, that's the first question. The second one is, I was right, wasn't I, in that they're, they're all not they're not interconnected populations. So each one of them is individually at risk for from a whole lot of things. And the third thing that didn't occur to me until just now, when I put that, are they competing with superb lyrebirds in in that patch? All right. So the first question, we don't really have a good idea of exactly how many lyrebirds there are. So I've seen estimates of 3,500. <laughs> I've seen estimates of 1,300. So I think there's probably around, somewhere around 10,000 individuals is what I, I would guess, given what I've seen across the entire range. I have looked at the connectedness of habitat and it's probably not as disconnected as you would think. So it depends where in the range you are. There are isolated populations like that population of Tambourine Mountain I mentioned. There's also a very small one that's estimated at only 10 individuals, which is near Ballina in New South Wales. And then, yeah, some populations are a little bit isolated, but in still reasonably large pockets of land, whereas others, they're connected, but they're in really thin habitat corridors. So there is actually some work going on with, I think, the, the Tweed Council and some other areas that are trying to improve connectivity between those populations. That's a really good sign that things might be improving. And in terms of competition with superb lyrebirds, as far as we know, there's no overlap between the two species. So I've personally never been to the area that's closest to where the two ranges are, but, yeah, they're they're not known to occur in the same area. Okay. Now, this is the bit where I get to go, newsflash, over to you, Holly. Oh, look, I've just dived into bird data. So I do actually have three records of people who have recorded Albert's lyrebirds in the Birds in Backyards surveys. Only three over the span of 15 years. Two of those, Tambourine Mountain. So that would be, if that's the area that's where these birds are most commonly coming into contact with people because it's the more highly urbanised region, then that's not surprising to see that's where those couple of sightings have come from. And the other one is just north um, of Mwimbala. That's not right. How did I say that? That's it. Yeah, definitely the Tambourine Mountain sightings. I do know people who 
have properties that back onto the national park where I work and they get live birds in their backyard sometimes. So someone I know is very lucky. They have footage of them using their pond to have a bath, which would be very cool. So there, there you go, Holly. They were probably some of Fiona's birds. Very possible. Now, I want to come back to you in a few minutes to to talk about what your conclusions, your main findings in your paper were. But let's let's go to Matt now because Matt's new to the gang. Hiya, Matt. How are you going? Good, thanks. Now, Matt, you're, you're doing your work out of University of Sydney and you're undertaking a PhD, but you're one of the Big City Birds gang, huh? That's right, I am. I was there before it was called Big City Birds. Again, for people who aren't up on the latest in the bird emergency world, Big City Birds is, is what has evolved from the wing tags project and then looking at bin chickens, the, the urban white ibis. What are we calling it now? Is it the Australian white ibis? It's not the sacred ibis or the bald ibis, Holly? Still, it's the Australian white I- ibis is the official name. But as you said, it goes by many names. Okay. And of course, people in in the urban centres of Australia will be familiar with the white ibis who are now scavenging in our bins and at the tip and all those kind of places. Matt, you're doing the brush turkeys. Tell us a a little bit about the brush turkeys. And while you're doing that, I'm going to put some of the the cool visuals that you sent to me up. Yeah, that's right. So I've been studying brush turkeys for the last four and a half years with my PhD, and I'm just at the tail end having submitted my thesis. And in that time, I've been studying just how the species is able to thrive in urban areas. And they've been fantastically successful at colonising and moving into the city suburbs like you can see in some of those. So they're from the megapode family, so the the big feet family. You might be able to see their claws in that photo. And what's really unique about the megapodes is that they, instead of sitting on their eggs and brooding them like lots of other birds do, they actually build these enormous nests out of soil and leaf litter on the ground. And it's the heat produced by the decomposition of that material that actually incubates their eggs. So in Australia, you have the mallee fowl and the orange-footed scrub fowl as the other megapodes or mound builder birds. And I became really interested in brush turkeys because they were actually quite rare up until the last couple of decades. And that's because of a mixture of hunting and land clearing. But it actually looks like the species was heading towards extinction by the mid-20th century. And now you have brush turkeys turning up in the inner city in Sydney and Brisbane. So... Something's happened and the species has come back from the brink. And that's really why I got into my research. And there's a nice overlap with the geographical locations of the brush turkeys and the Albert Slybird in that northern rivers, hip, hippie corridor and the back end of the Gold Coast and Brisbane. So let me ask both of you, is there actually an overlap between the two species, Fiona brush turkeys turning up in in your survey sites? Absolutely. I come across quite a few turkey mountains when I'm off looking for live birds and sometimes get tricked hearing a bird scratching, wondering if it's a live bird and it's actually a turkey. And Matt, describe how adaptable the brush turkey is. What kind of gardens or what kind of public landscapes can they make use of? I think they're incredibly adaptable and they can make use of almost any landscape. Um, They're an omnivorous species, so they'll eat whatever they come across. So they actually don't need that much green space or that much resources to survive. They can scavenge in people's backyards with a minimum of of vegetation. What's probably a bit more challenging for them is finding the locations to build their nests because they actually require a fair amount of space and several tonnes of soil and leaf litter. But they manage to build their nest in people's backyards and in city parks. So I think... Almost anywhere that isn't too dry to get the kind of leaf litter and moisture they need, they seem to be able to survive. Matt, I have to put my hand up and say, when I look at all the uh, slides I uploaded, the one that I forgot is the one that shows the uh, the nest mound that's basically taken over a playground. And if people are familiar with a slide, the playground slides, the the mound covers up two thirds of this of this slide. It's amazing. So no doubt a couple of tonnes is certainly the minimum amount of leaf litter 
that they would require. Holly, I want to ask you, are they causing problems that that people report to your team? They are one of those birds that people either have a real affinity for or, like you said, Grant, can cause some issues. So you have some people like myself who admire their tenacity. In fact, that they have come back from the brink. I know I'm in Wollongong, so just south of Sydney. Up until even five years ago, it was very rare to see a brush turkey. It's still not entirely common, but there are some locations where there are a good number of them and you can see that sort of spread starting to happen. But yes, they are a problematic bird for a lot of gardeners um, and it's around that mulch. It's the fact that they are disturbing so much soil and so much mulch and taking over gardens often in places where people are particularly particularly wanting to have some space and then you get a giant brush turkey mound in the middle of your yard and it can cause some issues if you're wanting to use it. Matt, do you have recommendations for how to minimise? I I get asked a lot and and I know you can do the chicken wire under the mulch to try and minimise things, but does that work? I've heard a lot of recommendations and I've seen a lot of them tried out and my conclusion is there's no single way that's definitely going to keep a brush turkey out, but everything might work and everything might help. So anything which makes it difficult for them to dig and scratch in the backyard. So like you said, using chicken wire or if you have a layer of gravel on top of your mulch or large sharp wood chips, they don't like digging in that. So they're more likely to move on somewhere else, but it's not guaranteed. Legislative wise, are you allowed to dismantle a turkey mound or do you have to leave it alone? Technically, you're not allowed to dismantle it once there's eggs inside the mound. But it's almost impossible just looking at a man to know what those eggs. So my recommendation is usually if it's still in the construction phase, it's fine. But as soon as it's full size, it's got that plateau shape, you can't touch it without possibly damaging eggs. And if you leave it too late to clear anyway, males have a tendency to keep coming back to the same spot. So my advice is as soon as you see a male come in and start building a mound, try to remove the mulch and move him on and he'll probably find a better spot. So I'm I'm guessing from that statement, Matt, uh, you, you can provide a, an environment in your garden that is not conducive to invasion by a brush turkey, but at the same time, it may not be conducive to growing your plants. That's right. If you pave over everything, the turkey's going to have no interest in your garden, but neither would most people, I think. That's right. Just a question again for both of you. How far south? Has the brush turkey extended its range that you know of? And how about extending westward into other sort of towns and environments that, like towns that have great public gardens? Brush turkey is just turning up. It's um, really interesting you you ask that because they seem to be expanding further south and further west now. And Holly mentioned she's seeing them occasionally around Wollongong now and they don't go much further south than that. But we actually have historical records as far south as Cape Howe and even Jindabyne. So they clearly have the potential to expand further south, but we think their range is actually smaller now than it was historically. I'm waiting for the dramas that occur when they've invaded Melbourne, the eastern fringes of Melbourne, and are getting into all of the the, the hippy-dippy types who building amazing specimen display gardens and going on all those postcards shows and have opened up their beds at bed and breakfast and whatnot. And then the, the, the army of brush turkeys come in and, and destroying their permaculture dreams. And anything interesting in your surveys, Holly? Look, I've got a few records from down around sort of Pambula. So that's getting very close to the Victorian border. Only a few records though. The vast majority are up through Sydney and North. Wollongong has, yeah, a a reasonable little population, all centering out from the Botanic Gardens, unsurprisingly. And yeah, look, there there are some records further further west, even to Blue Mountains and and beyond. So it'll be actually really interesting to break that down year by year and see if we can notice when that that spread was happening. Yeah, what I had in mind uh, was Toowoomba and Orange and places like that that have amazing public gardens and they might be hit with the double whammy. They might be getting brush turkeys and cane toads at about the same time. Yay. Look, none around Orange, not quite that far yet. 
but certainly there are some sort of Western sightings that are popping up. Fiona, a brush turkey is bad for... I don't actually know. I feel like brush turkeys aren't as common in the areas that I work as lyrebirds are, actually. So I come across fewer brush turkeys than I do lyrebirds. It could be that I'm looking out for lyrebirds instead. Yeah, I'm not sure if they have slightly different foraging strategies or if they really are competing together, but it's an interesting question. Could, could the density of the vegetation cover have much to do with that? Uh, maybe that's one for you, but probably, Matt. It's quite an interesting question because we know that competition between brush turkeys is less intense when the vegetation is thicker. So the males will um, locate the nest mounds closer together when there's a lot of thickets of shrubs reduce that competition. As far as competition with other species, I've seen their territory overlap with the superb life quite a bit and I've seen them co-occurring in the same areas. And I've actually got video in an archive somewhere of a lyrebird foraging in an abandoned brush turkey nest. So it could be a case of whether competing, but sometimes also facilitating each other with the turnover of soil. It's probably a really complicated question that needs a lot more research. Oh, the, there you go. Your postdoc work for you, Matt. Uh, Matt, I'll, I'll just ask you now because I'll forget later. If you can find that in the archive and I'm allowed to put it on the website, I'd love to do that. Um, Absolutely. I'll look it up. Yeah. Fiona, are they generally similar habitat types? I'm displaying my non-scientist proclivities here, but t- tell us what the habitat type, I'm thinking it's probably a, a wet scleriful kind of environment, but tell us where the Albert Slybird like to locate themselves. A wet sclerophyll is a right answer. They're very much rainforest-based birds, so you find them in in rainforest, both the sort of subtropical rainforest and temperate rainforest in that area, as well as wet sclerophyll forest, but you don't find them in drier areas. So when you can find superb lyrebirds in dry sclerophyll forest, you won't find Albert's lyrebirds in that kind of forest type. Very interesting. Matt, what are the limiting factors for the brush turkey in terms of where they will go? The I guess the primary limiting factor is the resources they need for They need, obviously, the space for the nest. They need a sufficient amount of leaf litter, but it also has to be fairly moist leaf litter so that it decomposes properly to produce that heat they need. So there's a limit to how arid their environment can can be. For example, you're not going to see them overlap the same kind of dry habitats that the mallee fowl will use because they just need more moisture than that. And I would think that temperature as well. If it gets too cold, the the heat from the nest will probably be insufficient to incubate the eggs. So perhaps the gardeners of the Dandenong Ranges and Macedon and Wood End are safe? I wouldn't place any bets because brush turkeys have consistently surprised people who've said they can't spread any further. But eventually there'll come a point where it's probably too arid. All right. Holly, a question for you to encompass both species. What's the conservation outlook, do you know, for both of these? What, what are they... What are they tagged as at the moment? Uh, oh, gosh, good question. Brush turkeys, there is, there is no... No, they no are threat. Fine. They, yep. are, they are fine. Alberts, I believe, are listed. Fiona will probably know more than I yep. will. Alberts are listed as near threatened at the moment. But in New South Wales, they're listed as vulnerable. So it's a little bit different depending on New South Wales and Queensland. Okay, let's continue on with that theme for just a minute, Fiona. What, what are the threats for the for the Albert Sly bird, which are human-induced and which aren't? And I guess, is it increasing? Are the threats increasing, in your opinion? Pretty much everything, I guess you could say, is human-induced. So their past threats were logging um, and habitat loss, as well as being shot, which we have a great <laughs> proclivity to do. Their current threats, we think, could be things like foxes and cats, so introduced predators, and also increased fire. So in the... 2019, 2020 bushfires, about a third of their habitat burnt. And that's in areas that really shouldn't be burning. So if you know, fire gets worse in those areas, that's going to become a really serious threat to Albert's lyrebirds. That's probably the biggest danger for so many of those forest and woodland birds and, and farmland birds, let, let's be honest about it. Holly, I know, there's probably no research or anything to back any of these views up, but what's your gut feeling about how fire is going to threaten birds that we we think are, are, are common, like birds that are at back of mind when we raise conservation issues? Oh, yeah, look, 
I think there's no doubt that it can, inappropriate fire management regimes can impact on um, a whole range of birds. And we certainly see that with powerful owl that prescribed burns, so burns to keep leaf litter down and reduce the risk of, of extreme fire, often happen during for powerful owls when chicks are fledging, which means that they are particularly susceptible because they're you know, not able to move. So uh, that could be, re- sorry. Sorry, Holly, I just want to interject. Is that now, like at the, at the moment, at Melbourne today has prescribed burns going on in, in precisely the kind of habitat that we're talking about. Now, very few people are objecting to any kind of controlled burns because our disastrous fire seasons are in the mind. But are these a problem? And I'll come after Holly to both of you, Fiona and Matt, about the fire ratio. Yeah, yeah, sure. So at the moment with Powerful Owl, we're seeing that they're pairing up and they're starting to breed. So that's when they're particularly sensitive because... They're selecting a nest hollow and so this is their opportunity. They can get spooked quite easily at this time. And then we find in Sydney at least, we tend to do a lot of our burns in spring, which is when the chicks are just fledging. And so that's when, again, the young birds are very susceptible because they're not able to move away well enough in terms of those burns coming through. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you don't want massive wildfires ripping through areas as well. And we're going to see... All the climate change modelling predicts that you're going to see more extreme weather events, more extreme fire events. And so those sort of massive catastrophic burns are, of course, going to decimate entire landscapes, which is going to result in not only a loss of the wildlife themselves that are not able to escape the fires, but you're going to see, particularly, I think, hollow nesting species are likely to be probably even more affected because you're going to get a loss of those hollow bearing trees. And so while you might get some trees that are able to recover and Australian, a lot of Australian trees regenerate post-fire, but those hollows take such a long time to form. And so if they are taken out of the landscape, then those hollow nesting wild birds and other wildlife are really going to struggle. Fiona, things like controlled burns impacting Albert's Firebird in, in your study area? Most of the places would not be burnt. So because they're occurring in rainforests, you don't get controlled burns in that kind of area. But I know there are some bits of wet sclerophyll forests that have been deliberately burnt in the past. And I think probably the real danger is that if, is if you burn these forest types too frequently, you're actually going to end up changing the forest type. So if you keep burning wet sclerophyll forests, you're not going to get the same species growing back eventually. So there's a danger that, that, yeah, they're going to lose habitat if that happens. But I don't think there's a, very much of that happening for all the sly birds. So if we were on q and I would now say I'll take that as a comment. Matt, have you got anything you want to say about prescribed burns and the fire regimes generally? Honestly, we don't know how fire affects brush turkeys or how brush turkeys affect fire for that matter. But certainly That's a like lot... Great. And isn't that really the point for so much of this? We just don't know. Absolutely. I mean, certainly a large part of the brush turkey's range was affected by the recent devastating fires and is probably quite fire prone in general. But we just have don't have the data to know how well the species is doing before and after the fires. Fiona, we might give you the floor again, talk about where you ended up with with your paper and then... What I'd like to do is have a little bit of a section where you're all free to interrogate each other, and that includes you, people that I can see with the little eye icon in my live stream who are watching along. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Twitch. If you've got something that you would like to know, I've done a good job. I've asked a couple of good questions today, but I probably haven't remembered everything. So, Fiona, tell, tell us about what you where you ended up and what was the main theme of the paper you published. And hey, tell us where people can read it too. Yeah, so I recently got to publish one of the chapters of my PhD, which was great. And that was looking at sequences of mimicry in the livebirds. So what you find with Albert's livebirds, when they sing their mimicry, it seems to be in this sequence that's the same or similar every time. So that had been noted before, but never actually confirmed. And so what I did was confirm it essentially. So I got long recordings of Albert Slybert singing and I classified all the mimicry and then I did a type of sequence analysis and I found that within males, each male sings a similar sequence of mimicry each time. So he's repeating the same things in a very similar order. What's really interesting is that within populations, 
all the males are singing things in a very similar order. So they seem to be what we call socially transmitting the sequence. So male livebirds are actually learning how to order their mimicry by listening to other uh, male livebirds in the population, which is really interesting and something that's not really been shown much before in birds um, and definitely not in mimicry. So that's cool. And the other thing that we found was that they actually order their mimicry so that you get a high acoustic contrast between consecutive vocalizations. So you might have when they mimic, they'll sing something with a really high pitch and then something with a really low pitch or something that's really loud and something that's really soft. And that kind of creates the impression of a greater diversity of sounds. So they seem to be organizing what they're singing to show off just how many different sounds they can make, which is pretty cool. So one chapter of the PhD, have you submitted everything? I have, yes. So I think I'm in the same stage as Matt by the sound of things, so I submitted and I'm just waiting for feedback. Okay. Now, Holly, you've been down that path. I think a lot of people don't know what you have to go through to to get to the stage of completing a PhD. So before we go to question and answer, our, our internal question and answer, Holly, can you walk us through the process of of applying to do a PhD and then what you need to do? Just so the non-academic types who may be watching and consuming get an idea of the kind of commitment that you and these dudes have have done. Look, it's been a while for me, so it'll be much more recent for these two on the call. Uh, look, doing a PhD is an, an all-life-consuming activity, really. It's your favourite hobby wrapped up in a really high-stress, long-term job that you have with, with a really tight deadline, basically. So it's something that you go into because you have a passion because it involves a lot, doesn't involve regular work hours. It, it, it involves a lot of stress. It, it, it involves not a lot of money, really no money along the way. So it's something that you don't, people don't enter into lightly. I, I loved doing mine, but it, it's really stressful. It's all about finding the right topic that you want to study, finding the right supervisor that you click with and, and you want to learn from. But it's about framing your own thoughts and contributing to scientific knowledge. And sometimes you, you can be lucky enough to get a scholarship. Other times you've got to work to make ends meet as well. I know I had a scholarship and then still didn't finish and had to work as well as trying to finish a PhD, which means the process can drag out for a very long time. And you do all this writing, you sub- you finally get it to the point where it's ready to be submitted and then it goes off um, to be reviewed and you wait. Like these guys are just waiting and waiting. And then in very rare instances, your thesis will be accepted with no comments and then you celebrate. I think it's very unusual for that to happen. Most of the time it comes back, hopefully, with just some minor reviews and you make those changes and then you're released. Otherwise, there may be some major reviews. It depends on your topic and your experts and how you go with it. So I'm, I'm hoping for the first two options for you guys. It's really, it's, it's a really massive commitment. Um, now, Holly, and, you mentioned you have to find a supervisor that mm-hmm. you click with and everything. And it's not like that you, you trot down to admin in your faculty or even university admin and you go into the PhD supermarket and you pick a topic and then you walk along a bit further and, and pick a supervisor. That's a difficult process, isn't it? Let's remind everyone. What was your PhD topic and who was your supervisor? So I looked at the impact of urbanisation, so living living with us on superb fairy wrens. So the little blue wrens, still strangely enough, my favourite bird, even after a PhD on them. But yeah, I always had an interest in urban species and particularly small birds and how they cope living with people. And they, yeah, they were just a a great study species for me. And, And I think I knew my supervisors already because I'd worked with them previously, but I guess th- that it can be, it could be somebody you've worked with through undergrad or through your honours, or it's you're reading papers, you're constantly reading the scientific literature and it's looking who's working in that space. And PhDs okay. are really about having initiative and you need to take a hold of what you want to do and so you need to go and find that person and approach them directly. Yeah, I think in, uh, in bird world, there's so many famous academics and they're only famous because you've seen... 2,000 papers with their names on them, either as a co-author or the main author. Holly, again, were you? did you do your 
University of Wollongong? Have you been local? I have. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit unusual. A lot of people travel around. I stay put. I am like a little fairy wren. I don't move very far. So yeah, I, I worked with now Professor Chris French from Wollongong Uni and Dr. Richard Major, who's the Australian Museum. And yeah, it was very lucky to have both of them as my supervisors and continue to be friends now. They're amazing. Fiona, who's Whose wing are you under? Now, we, we might point out too that you're, you're doing your PhD through a university that has not often been one that we see in print for ornithological kind of study. Yeah. Give your uni a, a bit of a wrap and tell us about, <laughs> uh, about your... Yeah, so I'm with Western Sydney University, which is, I think it's actually one of the biggest universities because it has so many different campuses and branches. So I'm in um, a department called the Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment, which is all very environmental focused, obviously, but it's still very broad. So there's just a really small lab studying animals. Half of us study live birds, half of us study bats. So there's a little bit of research coming out of here, but it's basically just the one lab in terms of birds. Now that's pretty interesting that you, the, the rest of the, the team who are doing birds are studying Lyre birds, are they studying both species? And what are the interesting projects that are happening? So there were two other students, one who's still going, one who submitted just before me, working on superb lyre birds. Yeah, one of my colleagues is working on female superb lyre birds and the other one is working on the Tasmanian superb lyre birds. And it's all vocalisation based for us. Yeah, Matt, now it's your turn. Yeah, so I'm part of the Integrative Ecology Lab at the University of Sydney. And we do a, a mix of all different kinds of work, but the, the common theme seems to be urban ecology with a lot of us. So we're interested in wildlife in cities and how they're affected by urbanisation. So my primary supervisor was Dieter Hockula from that lab, but also John Martin from now Taronga Zoo. I know he's been on this podcast a few times, and Alicia Burns from Taronga Zoo. Of course, John. I think I'm going to rope John in to be friend of the show status because he's worked on so many really interesting projects and leads the way. Now, Fiona's just uh, reminded me through the magic of of the internet that, Holly, Fiona did her master's on fairy wren. So I think we need to find out a little bit more about that, Fiona, because there's lots of fairy wren content in the bird emergency. Oh, great. Yeah, it was a few years ago now, so I'm a little bit rusty on it, but we are still trying to publish what I did, so hopefully that'll happen soon. But I was looking at the effects of different habitat characteristics on their nesting success as well as social organization so holly will obviously know that they're cooperative breeders so they live in family groups and so you've got multiple adults looking after the chicks so i was interested in looking at does the number of helpers impact their reproductive success how many young they can successfully raise in a season and does things like habitat type or vegetation density or other various habitat characteristics impact it as well. Now, Fiona, I can't let the opportunity pass but to say, did you listen to the episode of The Bird Emergency as part of the Pint of Science Takeover Week where I spoke to Atore, who was working in Melbourne and the, on the outskirts of Melbourne, looking at the complex social organisations of fairy wrens and how many of the groups how many of the group needed to be successful and all kinds of stuff like that. Now, of course, you've listened to that episode, haven't you? Uh, I'm not sure. I think I might have missed that one, unfortunately. But I know it's it's a really hot topic in the fairy wren world, looking at their social organisation because it's so wacky. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of fairy wren stuff coming up this year for the bird emergency. And we'll be following up on emu wrens, the Mali emu wrens as well with the translocation issues and the threats still happening there. And Holly, you just reminded me of another bit of the interconnectedness of the bird world. Holly, how about you tell us about... Uh... Oh, so John Martin, friend of the show now. So John and I did our PhDs in the same lab. So, yeah, there, there's lots of relationships amongst everybody working at PhD level or academia or research in birds in Australia. And so, yeah, the urban field, of course, is... is very small. Yes, we're, we're all connected. And Dita, I've worked with Dita on some students as well. And there's more connections keep coming. Yeah, another connection is my my current supervisor, Justin Belbergen, works with John Martin on flying foxes. So we're there we go. It's it, it's never ending. And yesterday I replayed the 
the discussion I had with Professor David Farr at University of Sydney about the paralysis disease that is affecting flying foxes and lorikeets. And yes, Holly has has given us a beautiful uh, comment and it's dead set. John Martin is our Kevin Bacon. Absolutely. Good on you, John. Now, we're at the point where I think those viewers should interrogate us if they would like to, and we can interrogate each other. Holly, let's start with you. Anything that you want to ask these two while they're sitting in our room? Okay. I guess really basic for Matt, what makes a good brush turkey? Is it just the leaf litter or is there more to it? There's a bit more to it than that. So they need the right mix of leaf litter as well. The ideal mix doesn't have too much eucalyptus litter because that's quite slow decomposing and quite dry. But they also need a certain amount of shade, especially over their nests, and just to keep that moisture in there. So a good mix of mulch and shade and obviously things to eat in the garden helps them out as well. So there's lots of invertebrates there or lots of fruit for them to eat. They'll absolutely love that. How about the introduction? The interaction with pets, like I'm guessing that dogs don't go well with brush turkeys, but what about people who have cats or maybe have things like ducks? It's really interesting. I've heard of um, every interaction possible under the sun between brush turkeys and other animals, you know, from dogs and cats chasing the brush turkeys to brush turkeys chasing the dogs and cats, sometimes small kids. And a lot of the time they don't interact antagonistically at all. I've heard of Brush turkeys confusing chickens, especially black-coloured ones, for other brush turkeys and trying to attack them or mate with them. But then I've also seen brush turkey chicks growing up in the same gardens with chickens and then living completely passively alongside them. And even I had one very amazing story of a brush turkey chick that got caught in a chicken coop with the chickens, grew up with it, and then defended the chickens from a feral dog. So I've heard of every kind of possible interaction between brush turkeys and and companion animals. So imprinting and socialisation is strong, no matter what what species of bird it is, by the look of it. Fiona, have you got anything you want to ask anybody? I have a question for Matt about brush turkey foraging and if you are good at picking up when it's brush turkey and when it might be something else. Yeah, it's quite interesting because obviously brush turkeys and lyrebirds are a similar way of foraging, digging in the ground and raking in the soil. I know lyrebirds often, or superb lyrebirds anyway, have that very recognisable pattern they leave in the soil. I haven't noticed something similar with brush turkeys. It seems to be just a much more haphazard raking. So yeah, I just look for whenever there's swaths of cleared mulch, it's probably a brush turkey. Yeah. And there's one for you, Matt, from Yvonne on Facebook. What role do turkey mounds play on bushfires? That is a fascinating question because I've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence and stories from rangers and bush care workers saying that bushfires seem to be lower intensity whenever brush turkeys are around. And we think it's because they will gather all the leaf litter material into these nest mounds, which they then keep really moist and speed up the decomposition of the leaf litter. And so it actually becomes more difficult for the low to medium intensity fires to spread. But once fires become wind-driven and higher intensity fires seem to be driven more by wind, I can't imagine it would slow their spread very much. But it's definitely an area we need further research in. So when a fire becomes a, a raging inferno, cyclone of fire, perhaps the brush turkeys won't have any effect. I have to interject a little bit of stupidity just because I can. Donald Trump might have been right about raking the forest in that case. Superb live birds might lessen the fuel load in case as well because they're always turning over the leaf litter. So <laughs> there could be something in it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I stepped into that with trepidation. Fiona, who is, do you, can you think off, off the top of your head whose work that was? I know that Dr. Alex Macy, who was based out of La Trobe, did a lot of research on superb live bird foraging. So I can't remember if that was his paper or someone else's, but I'm, I'm sure he's done something on it. I can see Holly's looking it up now to to help us out which what before we wrap up i just got i'm watching my twitter on on another screen and mark from the climactic network has just tagged me in on twitter about something which is a bit of a bit of a worry that the the ukraine war just getting up a little bit more detail 
is causing a huge problem for the the raptors in Belarus, the white-tailed eagle being one of them that war has allowed all the people who are into ne- nefarious activities with wildlife to go unpunished and unnoticed because everyone's looking elsewhere. Yeah. Now, Holly, what did you find out? Yeah, so look, I'm, I'm looking at a paper by a student, so Daniel Nugent, who co oh, Dan, Yeah. Dan, Dan's a friend of the show. Wanderer guy. Yeah. So he found that different vegetation structures and compositions between burnt and unburnt patches, which had lyrebirds, and that influenced how they foraged and where they were found. And, yeah, again, pointing to the fact that it's likely that the lyrebirds are reducing fuel loads in some of those some of those unburnt patches and potentially, Matt was saying, around combining everything into a nice pile, reducing the connectivity of that litter and potentially in lessening the impact of a fire. Great. Uh, that's fantastic that Dan Dan's doing that work as well. Terrific. And yeah, this was 2014 it was published. Okay, must early on. Good on you, Dan. Fiona, we're, we're in that wrapping up stage now. So what's what I would like you to tell us all is what do we need to do to help out the Albert's Lowbird in that unique pocket of Australia that's under such urban spread pressure? And where can people read your article if they are interested? Actually, am I able to put a link on the website so that people can find it easily? Yeah, absolutely. Great. And Um, and I will do that. It will be on the link from here. And of course, I'll promote the hell out of it on Twitter at Bird Emergency. So, Fiona, the floor is yours. Yeah, so the good news with Alvis Live is there are actually a couple of programs happening at the moment that people who live in that area can get involved with, so real citizen science type projects. Some of it is to just work out where libraries are. So you can, if you have a property in that area or can get out into that area, then you can do surveys for libraries and find out exactly where Albert's libraries are occurring. So they're trying to fill in some of the gaps in knowledge. The other thing is they're trying to increase habitat corridors. I think I mentioned that before. And also clear out weedy vegetation, so things like... Lantana camara is really bad for livebird habitat, and there's a lot of that growing wild in those areas. So they're trying to clear out some areas. So if you have a property in that area and you've got that on your property, to try and get rid of that, plant more native species, um, and just improve the rainforest quality there. So I can send some links for the program. Please, please do, and I'll create a the list on the page. And I can tell you later on today, it will be thebirdemergency.com slash Fiona. We'll make that one nice and easy for people to to find. Is, is there anything else that people really need to know about, about Albert's Library? I suppose it's not super relevant for a lot of people because most people don't live anywhere near where they occur, but it'd just be nice if more people know that they exist. A lot of people know about suburb Lyrebirds but have never heard of the Albert's Library. And so for people living in that corner of North and East South Wales and Southern Queensland, if you haven't heard of them, Get out there. Go for a walk in one of the national parks and have a listen out for them, especially in winter. They're really quite something to listen to. Hopefully Fiona will give me a couple of sound clips and I'll throw them on thebirdemergency.com slash Fiona. And if you live in that area or you're visiting that area, as well as taking your binoculars, you can tune your ears in to particular sounds that you might hear in the dense forest. Tell us about what people can do to be involved with brush turkeys? Brush turkeys, I guess, were fortunate. They might be the kind of bird you can spot in your very own backyard. So I'd direct everyone to the Big City Bird Citizen Science Project and get, report any brush turkeys you see, whatever behaviours you see them doing. And particularly if you see any with a wing tag, we're really interested in tracking how they're moving through the urban environment. And yeah, Citizen science is probably the best way to engage with brush turkeys. And Holly, we need to say, what was it our last? Was it our last stream or was it the one before where we had John Martin telling us all about the Big City Birds project? It was the one before or the one before that with Jennifer Colburn as well where we talked about cockatoo behaviour and cockatoos in the cities as well. Let me really lash out. Birdemergency.com slash cockies, C-O-C. 
C K I E S. I'll make that. Isn't it great having easy links? Slash tilde one forward. Let's just make it easy. Cockies. Holly, what's coming up in Bird Life Australia land? Oh, always lots and lots of things going on. So the best way to find out is probably to follow Bird Life social media. So at Bird Life Oz for Instagram and Twitter. Birds in Backyards, we're always doing our garden bird surveys. So you can pop on by following that link to join us and tell us what's happening in your garden. You may have a brush turkey and a few other things we'd love to hear about. Uh, We'll be doing some session soon training for Powerful Owl Project. If anybody in South East Queensland or Greater Sydney is keen to keep an eye on some pretty amazing birds. So again, following social media, you'll find out we've got in Sydney a session coming up on the 7th of April. So if you just uh, follow the Powerful Owl Project on Facebook, we'll have lots of information there. Otherwise, I'm going to be at Eden Gardens Nursery at Macquarie Park in Sydney on Sunday, taking people for a bird walk. So it should be uh, fun. Holly, is that a is that a booking kind of thing, or just people rock up to Eden Park Nursery? It's an yeah, it is, has an Eventbrite ticket, okay, so good. it's a sustainability festival. So there's all day. Okay. I will send you the link. Yes, and and I'll put that on the on, on the underneath this this stream page. The the socials that that we all use. Let's finish up with those. Fiona, where can people follow you or engage with your stuff? I have to remind myself what my Twitter thing is. What do you uh, prefer? Are you, are you a Twitterer or a Facebooker? Or work work wise, it's Twitter. Yes, yeah, so if you want to contact me about live birds, then then find my Twitter. So that's just Fiona underscore Backhouse. That's easy. I'll it'll be on the page as well, of course. Matt, you've made it a bit easy by putting it in your. Oh, I don't want that. Oh, I don't want that. There we go. Look, I've done there. I want to do that because there's yours. It's easy. Matt Hall is at Echo Matt 94 Yeah, just send me a message on Twitter for anything brush turkey related or urban ecology related. Always happy to chat. Fabo and Holly, you're always easy to find. I don't think we've actually had this one. I use Twitter more than everything else, but what's your preferred social media kind of contact if people want to um, say, Holly, I, ju- I just saw, I don't know, Bin Chicken making a phone call. So you can reach me at Twitter at Urban Birds Oz is the Urban Bird Program Twitter account. So you can reach me there. Instagram, it's at Birds in Backyards. I'm on all the time, so it's easier to send a message there. Facebook-wise, we have a group. So we have a bird, if you search for Birds in Backyards Australia, you can join the Facebook group. There's about 38,000 people in there who all love all things urban birds. And so it's a really a great place to see some amazing photos, to learn about different birds that you'll see and, and interact with some really great people. Fabo. And if you want to talk to me, God knows why you would, because I'm always out here. There's just too much of me. At Bird Emergency on Twitter is my preferred social media. Bird Emergency is on Facebook, is on uh, YouTube. Actually, there's the thing. We're tr- I'm trying to get to 500 subscribers for YouTube, so be nice. Go and subscribe. Uh, I need to put more effort in- into the channel. It takes time. But at 500 subscribers, I get access to the community message board, which makes it easier to talk to people who are interested in birds and bird conservation. Hey, go and subscribe. Let's let's get that happening. And if you're in the conservation world, the bird world, and you want to alert me to something that I should be talking about or covering, email news at thebirdemergency.com. Anything else you want to tell us about, gang, before we wrap up? No, but the crow wanted to tell us something. I wonder what he's saying. Yeah. Three, or the owner put some water in the water dish. It's it's empty. Maybe the crows need some research, love. I'm not sure what this research is happening on crows at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's postdoc. Actually, there we go. There's something relevant. Fiona, when do you, you've submitted everything. When do you think you'll be doing your defence? We didn't talk about defending your PhD. Who defence here? Oh, I think that's thanks. interesting. Or we, yeah, we don't have defences. It's once you get your feedback from the examiners, you just have to do whatever they tell you to, and then your supervisor signs off on it, and that's it. Yeah, okay. yeah. We had, we had a presentation. We had to do a presentation to staff at, at our uni, but that was it. There's no defence like they do in the states. From what I hear, yeah, I was going to say, Claire. I'm pretty sure Claire Claire Greenwell defended. 
had to defend hers. I'm sure she told me about that. And they did the was they live streamed it. I think so. Yeah. How about you, Matt? When's your submission date? And oh, you've done that, yeah. You when yeah. you're waiting for comments. Who knows how long it will take at this stage. I was advised three months, but told to realistically expect much longer than that. Fantastic. And gives you time to be sniffing around for a postdoc opportunity, no doubt. So that's great. Fiona Backhouse from University of Western Sydney, thank you for being involved. You're, you only need one more appearance and I think you become a friend of the show too. W- welcome, welcome aboard, Matt. Matthew Hall at University of Sydney. Holly Parsons, Manager, Urban Birds Program at BirdLife Australia. Thanks again, Holly. It's always great to to get you on the screen and talking birds. And for the people on Facebook and Twitch who were joining in, thank you so much, especially Yvonne, for, for becoming part of the show. I'm Grant Williams. This is Monday Megaphone, the bird emergency, birdemergency.com. You'll notice it's improving hour by hour as I make make improvements to the website, which I left unloved for many years. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.